Evan. I'm an American I'm living in Paris. I'm going to be talking about um, about new work today, work I'm going to be presenting for the first time, work that was supported um, by uh, the Black Chamber, by Masters and Servers, and so I'm very thankful to them for what happened. And I'm going to try to speed through the beginning of my talk so I can get to that new work. Um, so if, if you'll permit me to move kind of quickly at the beginning here, I'm going to touch on a few pieces that I feel like at least hopefully make it seem like this new project doesn't come from nowhere, because I see it as being connected to some past work. Okay. So. To quickly kind of start, I, I kind of trace back my artistic practice to a moment when I was um, an architect a long time ago, or studying to be one, when I had one class within the architectural computer lab where a teacher used Fetch, which was this program that had the metaphor of a dog that would take a bone to the internet and drop it in, in a folder. And to me, this was like, kind of like mind blowing at the time. I mean, it was really, I trace being an artist kind of back to that moment. Like that made me want to stop doing architecture and start doing something completely different. It was the kind of like single most empowering moment I've kind of had in my adult life. And it's a function of being introduced to the internet as an adult, which I think is maybe um, something specific to my sort of generation. Um, so that's kind of where I start, how I was becoming an artist anyway. And from that moment, I started making other work. I, I co-founded an organization called the Graffiti Research Lab. Graffiti Research Lab was all about making uh, kind of open source hardware, open source software, and, and using that in collaboration with activists and graffiti writers. Um, that organization, as it sort of started to tail off, we, my co-founder and I, James Powell, we then started this other lab called the Free Art and Technology Lab, which was, it was really taking uh, kind of influence from the influencers in a way, this idea of radical entertainment, where we were trying to do I mean, primarily, I would think of them as activist-driven projects that were clickable. Like, we were trying to make projects that were fun, that you'd want to watch, irregardless of the politics. This is a collaboration that the group did, um, where we duplicated a Google Street View car by renting a car and just putting a Google logo on it. This is the second most technologically empowering moment of my life, and be able to drive a Google car. It's incredible. Sidewalks, anything you want to do. Um, <laughs> That video is online, we can watch it later. So these are sort of moving through time now. I'm, I also, during that period and, and moving past that period, I've also been interested in making projects that try to come to some sense of what the internet is, what my relationship to the internet is, um, culturally what the internet is. This is a series of prints that I've been doing uh, based on my internet cache. This is like one month of internet browsing. This is two, I, I archive my internet cache um, in about three week segments. I've been doing that for a few years now. Um, I have another series of work that's more about um, visualizing and archiving these kind of like first clumsy moments we have where we're touching pixels. This is called multi-touch paintings and so I, I'm trying to like immortalize these gestures that our devices are telling us to do. So this one's called slide to unlock. Um, this one's called zoom in, zoom out. All these new kind of movements that human beings had no reason to be doing up until about 10 years ago. <laughs> this one's called next, next, next. So it's meant to sort of be part visualization, part commentary on, I mean, maybe the sort of bluntness of how we're consuming media and something that feels very high tech and how programmable systems are changing a lot as they move to our pockets and become casual. So all that's going on. I, I also, through that period, I, I make net art. Some of my happiest moments making things are making net art. Um, just as one example, this is from a series called No Original Research that's meant as a kind of homage to the commons. It's, it's a series of websites that are using found animations from Wikipedia. Um, copying them you know, dozens of times, pulling them all into one browser, uh, and then the piece is kind of about that path through the network. So as the browser's trying to load all those packets in this linear fashion, it doesn't happen. Um, I mean, it doesn't happen immediately. And so what we get left with is not a perfect circle, right? We get left with a circle that's kind of a visualization of those packets path through the network. Um, and it sort of functions as visualization, part, sort of functions as a, a totem to the commons. So there, there's net art, and so I'm, I'm kind of moving through these like, projects that are involving public space and programmable systems, projects are thinking about the network. And as I'm making all that work, the internet changes a lot, as we all know. Um, the, the way I see it anyway is that there was this kind of like trinity of terribleness that happened to the internet. Right? One point of that triangle is 
this kind of opposite of the Big Bang that happened, where instead of the Big Bang explosion of servers, it sort of starts crunching back down, and now we're kind of left with one server to buy stuff, one server for social, one server for search, and it seems like that's the trend that's gonna continue. So there's this centralization is one point in the Trinity. The other one, of course, is monetization of the internet. Um, I, I really see Gmail as kind of this fundamental point when the floodgates to convenience got opened in a way where we couldn't really, we'll never be able to close them again. Like once we kind of culturally accepted that companies could read our email and advertise to us in there. I think there was no going back from that point. Um, and then the third point, of course, is the NSA GCHQ spying scandal, which as much as I know we've seen these slides a lot, like I, I feel like it's good to keep talking about them rather than feeling that they're passe. Like this is stuff I'm still wrestling with in my work. And it leads into my kind of changing worldview of the internet um, that I think is maybe shared by a lot of people. Um, and the internet started to start to feel like this, right? Where the, the kind of lolcats, they now look like Trojan lolcats to me. Um, and, and I can't even see the lolcats anymore. Like, this is how, what I see when I look at the internet, and it's no longer the kittens and the unicorns. It's like, you've peeled back the fur, and there's this kind of Skynet waiting there to sort of snitch on you. Um, and it's funny and it's sad, but for me it was the truth. And, and as someone who, as an artist who had the internet kind of being a primary player in my art practice, this was like a serious hurdle to get over because I didn't feel like making work in that medium or at least didn't feel like the work I was making felt like it did when I uploaded that first HTML file via FTP, right? The kind of, um, the optimism was sort of quickly disappearing. The empowerment was definitely disappearing. And so I needed to sort of have some kind of reset within my practice. Um, and so, so one thing I started looking at is, is something that I think a lot of us are sort of looking at, which is that we don't have a very good public conception or visualization of what the internet was. Like there wasn't necessarily, at least for me personally, I wasn't that interested in thinking about it, what it was when, when the internet was unicorns and MP3 files. Um, but I think the reason that you, we see artists and journalists and researchers kind of tackling this problem of internet as infrastructure right now is because or if I just speak from my own personal standpoint, I feel like you go through these moments of maybe disempowerment and there's a natural human tendency to be like, okay, wait, what happened? Let's reset. What is this thing? What does it really look like? How is it built? Where does it go? Who regulates it? Um, yeah, what does it look like when it comes out of the street? What does it feel like when you hold it in your hand, when it goes under the ocean, when it's in moments of transition between the ocean and the land? Like, what is the internet? What does it look like? And it's something that... Um, was dealt with a lot in the book Tubes by Andrew Bloom. Um, and, and one thing he writes about, and he writes from a kind of personal story, personal standpoint of his kind of path through understanding the infrastructure of the web. But he keeps coming back to this idea that the internet has no landmarks, which is something he points out as being interesting, right? Because it's this thing that's maybe defining of our moment in history, and yet there's no place to go visit it. There's no place to go contemplate what it is. Um, and so from reading that text and reading another text called Mother Earth Motherboard by Neil Stephenson, which was written quite a bit earlier, um, I sort of started to set out plans for going on my own internet pilgrimage. I, I started going, the first, the first visit I did was to the Cornwall area, which is where Stephenson does his journey, which is where 25% of the internet still flows through. A lot of people cite this one beach on the westernmost coast of the UK as being one of, if not the most, um, let's say technically important nodes in the internet uh, and spied on nodes of the internet. Um, and it, it also has this really interesting history of that, that beach right now that has these dozen or so fiber optic cables coming up in a very small beach is the same exact beach that the first telegraph cables came through is within a mile or two of Marconi's um, wireless station that sent the first radio signals across the Atlantic. So there's all this interesting history. There's all this interesting data happening there right now. And so that was the kind of first trip I did, and that, that was about a year and a half ago now. Basically, I got to those locations and started documenting the surroundings and started thinking about them as landscapes. Um, and in the beginning, I was there to kind of find the evidence, right? I was looking for the manholes and looking for the cables. But the longer I started, started walking around in this landscape, which is another thing that Bloom references in his book, which is that there's this sort of interesting phenomena that happens when you sort of venture out on these nerdy um, tourist destinations, that you're looking for this thing that's sort of massively connecting us all, and you're standing on sand that's you know a couple meters above where terabytes and terabytes are flowing beneath you every split second, but you're always alone. Like it's by design that the internet comes ashore in these kind of lonely remote places. And so there's this weird thing of being connected and being alone that, that Bloom talks about and is something I really felt when I was out there. And so I found 
the things I wanted to point the camera at were like less and less becoming the actual infrastructure and more and more becoming just these moments that I found on that journey that sort of were more representative of the kind of internal dialogues I was having and wrestling with. Um, and I also loved how it was really quiet. Like the internet comes up in these really, really quiet moments. So at the beach in Porth Kerno, the only thing marking this like the biggest possible landing spot on the whole globe of the internet is this one little yellow triangle sign that was probably made in the 70s and it says telephone cable. It's like really like this beautifully understated um, kind of moment in the landscape. And so anyway, I was kind of shooting these landscapes that resulted in a show that I did in London that opened last year at Carol Fletcher. And since, since then I've, I'm kind of interested in continuing that research and so I've been doing more traveling, uh, visiting more locations. I've been trying to come to better understandings about what the internet really is. And so one thing that I've been interested in lately is this idea that it's, everything kind of falls within this electromagnetic spectrum, right? And so the, the internet when it's firing in this invisible near infrared light that's going through fiber optic cables, it's, it's in different frequencies, but it usually centers around the 1550, 1550 nanometer mark, which I think is about 1 60th of a human hair. So it's, that's, that's the length of the peaks between the signal that's going through the fiber optic. Um, so that happens here, just beyond the kind of really narrow sliver of visible light, you get this kind of near infrared range, which is kind of what's transferring the data. Um, and so as a visual artist, an interesting thing is that all consumer cr cameras, the CCDs and consumer cameras are actually sensitive to that range of light. And by design, right before the CCD gets put in the camera in the factory, they stamp on an infrared blocking chip on top of it, which looks like, which looks like this. And so the functionality in the cameras we all have in our pockets, most of them in our phones, they can actually see this light. They can see this infrared light, and it's just a process of removal to be able to start documenting it. And you get images like this. So this is straight out of the camera. This is not manipulated at all. The infrared light reflects differently than visible light. So you can, in this image, it's a little dark, but you can tell that the vegetation, the infrared light reflects more off of organic matter. So things like skin, things like the eyes, um, things like grass and trees, it reflects more than the inorganic matter. So it acts, it's not just a change in tint, it's actually fundamentally, func it, it functions differently visibly. Um, so this is kind of the technical work I was doing in terms of how I was gonna, one way I was gonna start documenting this work. Um, and when the application for the masters and servers call came out, I knew I wanted to make another trip. And instead of going to a place that was technically important to the internet, I wanted to make this more a place that would be like, wh where would my internet monument be, right? And my biggest influences from the internet come from initially the Pirate Bay, which led me to the hacker group Pirate Biron, um, and the work that they were doing surrounding, I mean, at the time it was the file sharing debate. Um, but they were like my cultural heroes. The Pirate Bay, I think, is, I mean, when it was framed the way they framed it originally, it was probably, I think, maybe the most important project for me personally um, that made me want to go make things. And so if the internet had a monument for me, it would be in Sweden, right? And so, uh, so copy me, yeah, it's so beautiful. This is the, copy me is the sort of Pierre Biron's idea about, I mean, it's kind of a spiritual version of Creative Commons. It talks about the harmony between copying, pasting, and kind of the natural, the, the, the nature, the physics of data wanting to be copied and the false barriers that people try to put there are ones that on a long enough time scale are kind of doomed to fail. Um, so I started researching Sweden and the way these trips work for me anyway is I, I start looking for the internet with the internet. Um, and that's mostly just for practical reasons that I don't waste time when I get out on the beaches. And so for Sweden, I started with the submarine cable map, which is a public ex publicly accessible map through telegeography, which is a very popular site where you can see generally where these cables are coming ashore. And then I spend a lot of time walking around in Google Street View. Like almost every single click you can make that's along the coastline when I go to these locations, I, I view in Google Street View. And it's, uh, it can be like hours and hours of hours of not having any sign, but then every once in a while a sign will pop up like this. And you don't, some of them you don't know, right? Like this one I actually f found out after going that this is a fiber optic cable uh, marker. Some of them um, in Sweden you get the kind of nice cable with a K. So this nice little quiet beach with a little rowboat and the cable coming ashore. I don't view it as part of the art piece, but I did kind of, I was seeing kind of what John Raffin was seeing when he was making some of his projects where it's like, 
Street View can kind of become this other lens. It did feel sort of like photography. Like some of these felt like they were almost pieces. But this, this wasn't pieces. This was research. This is what I would put on my phone when I was going out to these locations because I would never have, I, would, I wouldn't be connected to the internet most of the times when I was on these searches. So, um, and so these were the beaches that I was headed out to. Um, so then, yeah, I booked the flight. Uh, I rented a car. Rainbows presented to me. Um, Sweden, I, I kind of focused mostly on Gothenburg and Stockholm. Uh, and so there's all these archipelagos, so you have to kind of drive onto these ferries and then take the boat out to these like really remote, strange places. And Sweden really opened up to me. Like, as a, as a, there's like a sort of cable hunter side of me that go goes along with the artist side of me that's just kind of happy to see the cables in any form when I get there. And like never in my wildest dreams would I think I would actually get these moments where you kind of you find the cable, first of all. It's literally just coming out of the ocean to you. No one's around. I was here for hours and nobody said anything. There's like a pile of rocks, which I didn't make. It looks like a monument to me. I don't know. And then it kind of goes off into the distance and just ends at this singular point of light in the sun. It was like, I, part of the job for me was, as an artist was trying to like convey those moments in an art piece, um, which is kind of doomed to fail. I mean, depending on how excited you get about cables. That was day one. This was like the first day I landed. I was there and I was just beside myself with no one to share it with, like all alone on this beach. And, and that kind of became part of the project. Um, and so I was documenting these with the, in infrared, um, shooting photos and, and these still kind of very still tripod shots. Um, these are some stills just there. Sometimes the cable would be in view. Um, Sometimes, I'm also just like fascinated by radio these days. Um, but so some of the photos have pieces of infrastructure in them. Um, or these clues to the internet is there. So the, a lot of the times, the internet is like really confused about whether it wants to present itself or not. Like it doesn't want to kind of tell us it's there, um, but it really doesn't want people to drop anchors on it because it's super expensive to fix. And so the signs are always looking away from us. Like the signs are always kind of facing the horizon line um, to the boats, not to the people. And so you kind of have, to, you're always presented with the sort of backside, which I think is sort of an interesting thing too. Um, but the, kind of some of the favorite pieces that I was coming away with and the favorite moments that I was just having in nature weren't necessarily those moments where I was pointing the camera at a cable and, and it was more just thinking about trying to use the infrared light in kind of like a more painterly way in a sense to kind of make compositions that maybe, that maybe reference in some ways the network, like maybe a singular line leading off into this branching network. Um, or maybe they're more just kind of representative of like the things that I was going through that led me to that location. And so my rule set sort of changed for the piece where it was no longer about me going out to these locations and being a journalist. It was more about me doing the research, getting in the road, going to those locations, but then allowing myself to just be an artist once I'm out there and sort of exist within nature and have these really quiet, solitary moments where I'm doing something that might be you know closer to kind of I don't know, like traditional Japanese landscape watercolors than it is about net art in a sense. Um, and so some of my favorite pieces are just these kind of nature. There's just this landscapes where maybe the cable's in frame, maybe it's not, um, but they have some sort of representation for me at least of kind of part of what I'm dealing with, not just in thinking about the internet, but kind of in, as just an art practice, trying to come back to some, trying to find these moments of optimism within this sort of bleak landscape that makes me want to kind of make work again. So, so this is a still from the piece uh, that's online now, and that's, it will be in the gallery tomorrow night. Uh, and it's composed of this tripod video shot, which is very slow, very kind of boring in a sense. Like, like one idea for the work is that after going through a lot of the work I was doing with Graffiti Research Lab and Fat Lab, I felt this pressure, like the internet was kind of, it was like a race with the internet to keep up with it, right? Like Fat Lab was kind of trying to release work in ways where it was gonna be, you know, social and was gonna be clickable and shareable and to stay on top of that was really difficult and as we, as the group got kind of older, I think we got less good at staying on top of how to do that. Um, but that push is always in the back of my mind at least, at least with that kind of work where it's like, okay, we gotta speed up, we gotta get faster, it's 120 characters now. Okay, TED Talk's only 13 minutes, like how long can this video be? Um, and so the internet was kind of making everything faster and faster and faster and it felt impossible to keep up with. I mean, especially as we you know, got older and started making other projects and doing other work and having families, it was like impossible to keep up with the internet in a sense. And so this project was like putting on the brakes really hard and going really, really slow. And so the video is, is um, 
they, they might be like difficult to watch. Like I don't even really expect people to sit there and watch it for you know 10 minutes or 12 minutes. But the experience of watching the video or trying to watch the video for me mimics the experience I was having out in the landscape, which was I was recording audio too, so I couldn't even walk around, right? So I'd set the tripod up and I'd film and I'd have to just sit there very still, very alone, not checking the phone, can't even walk around, and just have these sort of meditative moments um, where I'm documenting the landscape. And in the beginning, they were like horribly boring. And even artistically, I was like, found myself making decisions based on how much, how much more time I could put up with just sitting there in these sort of like meditative poses. Um, but the more I kind of felt like, the work out in the field and hopefully what's translated in these kind of long format, very slow videos is that there's these meditative moments that are trying to like peel back that clock a little bit and get away from the internet's constant push to be faster and shorter and more clickable. Um, and so, the, so I was recording them in infrared, I was taking GPS readings and the, the GPS readings then become the URL. You can then copy and paste the URL back into Google Maps and it'll take you to that location because the URL functions as an address both within the network and on the globe. So it has this like dual landscape. Um, and so that you can kind of then go back all the way through the project and see it again from the Google Street View. And, and those are kind of embedded within the source code. So if you peek under the hood, you can find hints to where those are. I'll, I'm not going to show, I, if the talk was going to be an hour, I was going to try to have us all watch this video for 10 minutes. And, 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 and the things I would have asked in that moment, in which if you want to watch it on your own time, is that like all the things that happen in that 10 minutes of you is kind of part of the piece. Um, so, you know, you're watching it and it's this kind of meditative video and your phone's going off and your email's going off and someone's pinging on Skype and you want to move the mouse so you can see how much time is left because you're bored out of your mind. Like, I view all that as sort of the, the process of watching these videos and my hope is that it stands in really stark contrast to the way we're sort of being entertained from all the other parts of the internet. Um, okay, I'll just show like a second of what it looks like, although it's... It's not that nothing happens in them, but there's also no payoff in the sense that we're sort of trained to be watching videos on YouTube with. There's changes that'll happen, like the, the light changes. When I, one thing I found out is when you sit really still in nature, nature comes to you. So in this video and some of the videos I'll be releasing later, you'll see things come in and out of frame, small things, birds, people sometimes, boats, airplanes. Um, you can kind of see, yeah, you even see it now, the light sort of changing, uh, the wind changes, sometimes there's water shots where the waves are changing. Um, and so it's not that nothing happens, but the things that are happening are all on the timeline of nature. Again. So this is like, slow. Okay. <clears throat> and so the audio you're hearing is, is also another part of trying to deal with visualizing the spectrum. And so this is, um, it's a kind of like custom hardware that's based on an Arduino. It's essentially a heart rate monitor. It's connected to an FM receiver, and it's, it's scanning through the FM frequencies based on pulse. And so the pulse you hear in the video is like the pulse, my pulse. Um, and for the most part, it's calm. Like I just, I just came back from filming in Sydney, and there was one location where I was filming, and the police came where I was at this big like FM transmitter tower, and you can hear the like the pulse like pick up as they're getting closer. <laughs> you can sort of see it in the graph when you view the sonogram of it. Um, but essentially, it's just it's just pulsing through the radio frequency, and every once in a while you'll get moments of some commercial FM station or some moments of some ham radio station or some police scanning station. But for the most part, it's just scanning through this mostly static. Um, and I, I think, like my hope is that idea of scanning, I mean even the word scanning sort of implies a search, right? And so I think, I hope embedded in all this work, whether it's through the camera trying to find something to land on, that even though it's boring and sort of dark looking, like my hope is that it's something beautiful in a sense too. It's like trying to land on some moments of hope within this darker landscape. And the audio I view is kind of being a piece of that too. It's also, 
referencing a ghost hunting technique, which also involves scanning through radio frequencies. Um, and then the last piece of how these are constructed is that if you take, if you take the URL and then you perform a trace route on it, all the videos are hosted, in this case, in Sweden. And so the project is expanding, so I just did finish doing Sydney. So in, in the case of the Sydney videos I'll be releasing soon, all those are hosted in Sydney. All these ones are hosted in, in Sweden. I have more in New Zealand. I have one in Paris. Like my monthly server bills are just like increasing like crazy right now. Um, but it was, it was important for me that this was part of the piece. So you can sort of see us down here, and this is, so this is a, a network trace route, which is just a common way of tracking the packet's course through the network from our, our, our IP address to the IP address of where that server is. And so the idea for me anyway is that as you're, as you're watching these videos, where did I go here? And you can kind of like close your eyes and, and feel that video as it's being, is shot in this infrared spectrum that it's being converted to and then firing through fiber optic cables and in some cases going through the frame that you're looking at. Um, and so there's that connection back to the network being sort of an integral part of the piece. Um, and, and in that sense, I see this work, I mean, hopefully as referencing a lot of the net art that's inspired me to make a lot of the work that I'm trying to make now, like work that I feel like I don't see as much being of made now, but I. I hope is still there, uh, but, but work that is really thinking about not just work that's referencing the internet or the aesthetics of the internet, but work that's integral to the network and that's essentially I'm trying to take some of the values of that work that's influenced me in how other artists have thought about the internet, other artists here, uh, other artists in Slovenia, um, and trying to take that kind of old classic network diagram and adding a bit more context to it um, and placing it within the globe and still, but still functioning within that kind of idea that the art still kind of happens here. Um, and so that's where I was gonna end. So the piece is gonna be, the piece exists essentially in the network. Like I've, my, my interpretation of it is that it's a networked video. It's not even necessarily a website. Like I don't think it's important that it has to be viewed through a browser. You could take the URL to that MP4 and stream it through, VLC, or you could stream it something without even touching Firefox, for example. But that experience of the, the video streaming from one location to you through these landscapes um, is the piece. And so you can see it online now. You can see it in the exhibition tomorrow. Um, and yeah, so one last thank you for supporting the project. This is the first time I've got to talk about it, so I'm excited to show all this work. And should we go on to the conversation now? Okay, thank you. Thank you.